much, Rob, for uh, being with us this afternoon on the third of our Tech for Good uh, sessions. Um, Rob and I go back five years almost, I think, now, where uh, Rob, who's been the managing director of B Collective and the Wise Enterprise Group for some time now, 12 or 13 years, is it? Yeah, that's about right. Probably well, you're, yeah, sort right. Of, you're born into your last name, so you sort of can't escape it, really. <laughs> Um, so, so Rob's been uh, with, um, in, in my knowledge of, um, of Tech for Good for at least those last five years. So it's great that we've been able to showcase uh, what you've been up to, Rob, and recently with uh, uh, Play for Lives. And uh, really interested to hear from you in regards to what's the latest and greatest. And uh, hopefully for those that are attending, those that will be uh, uh, tuning in afterwards to kind of understand What's going on? I mean, world domination kind of uh, sounds almost synonymous now with uh, the collective. So I'd um, love to hear more and over to you, really. Well, thank you for the introduction as with the, the bald guy talking about world domination. But uh, that's uh, it's certainly something that we're interested in uh, creating change on on a global on a global stage. So um, I think the purpose of today is to perhaps share a little bit about um, who we are, why we are and and what we what we hope to become, um, and how that might be supportive of um, different parts of our community to to better enable them to do what they do. Um, so I might just start briefly a little bit about um, our background, just because it might um, give a little bit of context as to why we've created B Collective. Um, but B Collective was really born out of. Uh, a family's involvement um, in a number of different social enterprises. So um, starting about 30, well, what about, about 40 years ago um, with The Body Shop uh, in, a, in Australia and New Zealand and having a very strong connection to values in that business through our association with Anita Roddick, for those who are familiar with her work, uh, sadly not with us anymore, but um, played a very important part of uh, if you like, holding and developing strong community values in an organisation, which for a long time was very, very progressive. Um, we sort of, through that time, fell in love with the concept of social enterprise just because it's empowering nature to be sustainable but to drive social change and to do it in a very agile way, to do it in a way that um, I suppose isn't um, governed by the restrictions that not-for-profit frameworks can often operate in, um, allows us to capitalise on um, different um, sort of, you know, innovation frameworks and, and, and those sorts of things that enable us to arrive at something which we felt would create a paradigm shift in our, in our world. So um, we didn't get involved in B Collective because we thought, wow, what an interesting space it's developing, let's get in there. We've developed B Collective because there is nothing like it in the sense that um, we wanted to take a different approach to those traditional software um, solutions of which there are, there are lots of uh, and of which all serve very um, good purposes in our community. Um, the biggest distinction I can probably talk about when we get onto B Collective, and I've got, I've got a little demonstration that I can go through today which might prompt some discussion and some questions. Um, is that what we refer to as B Collective is what we call social infrastructure or community infrastructure. And the reason that we do that is it's a common framework which recognises the way in which all organisations, all, you know, educational facilities, governments, councils, um, you know, large and small not-for-profits, big and small business, how they interface with each other. Um, because the reality is we don't work in silos. And so a standalone software that allows us to, if you like, uh, collect information of the people that we're responsible for, the people we're trying to help, um, is obviously necessary and very, very effective in doing that. But it's pretty one dimensional in the sense that how do we actually create interactive points where it recognises that a person has lots of senses of belonging to lots of different areas of their, of their life, where their kids go to school, um, the business that they work through that might also have value centric philosophies as an organisation. Um, so B Collective recognises those parts of a per, per person's ecosystem and equally um, acknowledges the way in which different organisations may work with one another in their pursuit of social change. 
Um, because it's infrastructural, it means that there is a central source of truth around that exchange. And that's really one of the cornerstones of, of that, that change in, or shift in value. So we are able to, if you like, qualify exactly what goodwill has been transferred, albeit somebody's time, um, donations, those sorts of things. But uh, understanding the nature of that impact is, is often one of the most difficult parts of, of managing that engagement and usually requires a lot of effort to verify and validate sort of um, in the rear vision mirror. So is now a good time, uh, Scott, to jump in and maybe do a bit of a prezzo? Yep, please do, Rob. Okay. So what I've got for you today is a bit of a user journey, uh, which might um, help articulate some of the things that I've been, I've been going through. Um, I'm not sure how um, questions work on this, in this forum, whether you're all muted or not, but I'm happy for Scott to yell out if there's a question or, or, or people would like further clarification. But rather than speak specific to features, I thought it perhaps best to, to talk about some of the ways in which we've leveraged this infrastructure in order to create benefit in a community. So we are a socially, um, we're, we're a, a social purpose organisation. So our primary objective is the social change itself. Um, so I'll go through how we do that. And so B Collective, um, rather than it being a corporate volunteer management system or a not-for-profit volunteer management system, um, it is infrastructure that any part of community can use in order to facilitate that exchange or that, that involvement. Um, and so quite uniquely, um, it is also user centric. So everything is built around the individual, if you like. The individual controls their information. They are the custodian of all of their data. It's free of advertising um, and it's free and accessible. And that's quite important for any sized organization in any sector. We do have a sustainability model, which is built around a layer of data and reporting, uh, which I can, I can talk to for those that are interested. But um, the core of what we do is, and, and the reason for why we do it, is that we have freely accessible tools for charities, for businesses, for councils, to better do what they do in community. Um, so Lisa starts our journey, and she's our volunteer for the purposes of explaining how this works. Um, you'll see that in this instance, it's quite group agnostic. It's just a way in which she might connect to a number of different parts of her life. She's uh, a member of 14 different groups. There's six opportunities that she's volunteering for. Um, it's some widgets that she can sort of move around that might make sense to her. Um, but you'll see down in the bottom right here, hopefully that's coming up for everybody. Um, what Lisa is presented with are opportunity suggestions, not based on her awareness of those groups, but based on an alignment, an alignment of what Lisa's most passionate about, what skills Lisa has, where Lisa is, when Lisa might be available. And so not only are we improving transparency of those opportunities for Lisa, but so too for those charity groups, um, we're able to reach new audiences. Um, a lot of organisations don't struggle to get volunteers, but it's usually the same 20 people putting up their hand every time. So how do we change that philosophy in our businesses, in our charities? How do we, how do we actually uh, expand and scale our programs beyond what we might be comfortable doing already? Um, this dark square here is one of the cornerstones of our, of our um, uh, philosophy, and that's the concept of a social record. So what we're able to provide as things are verified through that infrastructure is a verified account of how people have been engaged. So we know when the opportunities were, where they were, uh, we know what causes they related to when we've created them, but we've also established the skills that people will be exposed to, not just that are required of them. And so we're able to provide a verification, if you like, of things like skill, act, skill and development um, uh, processes within uh, the volunteering framework. As I'm sure most of you are aware, volunteering is one of the most powerful ways to give people exposure to, you know, skill and learning. And so, you know, universities and schools are embracing this as part of their modelling. And that's some of the work that we're doing. Um, we're also working in the wellness space. We've got a social prescribing project happening in Wales, which um, allows people to, if you like, um, 
take a journey of community activity as prescribed through health, the health system and have something tangible to show for it, which improves their, um, you know, identification of being connected, less isolated um, and, and more well. Um, so there's some of the things which I could probably expand to as we go through. So for Lisa, we're going to assume that in this instance, she could just search for something that she wants to do up the top and say she wants to do something, she wants to plant trees, she wants to deliver food, she wants to do something at a location. Um, in this particular example, we're going to assume that Lisa is already uh, being, uh, if you like, uploaded within the ecosystem of a charity that is using Bee Collective to manage their engagement. And so, uh, once again, a freely accessible tool for Rotary um, to use in this instance, where they can manage their opportunities, their donations and storytelling through, through Bee Collective. Um, so for Lisa, um, the, the thing that she's really interested in is actually doing something. So when these opportunities have been created, as I said, mentioned before, they've been mapped. Data integrity and usability is one of the, the founding elements of Bee Collective so that we're able to gather those insights live and dynamically when we most need them. And so you'll see that there's a couple of um, opportunities here that might appeal to Lisa, but you'll also see that there's one here from Uniting. And the idea is that not only can you have your own opportunities and manage them quite discreetly, and but you may want to bring other people's opportunities into your ecosystem. So if you're an aggregator of opportunities and that's part of your mission, if you're a business and you want to collect and curate opportunities that might suit your, your um, CSR or CR programs, if you're a council and you're a hub and you want to be able to um, provide a better conduit into community for those, those partners, then you can actually endorse the opportunities of others and bring them into your own ecosystem. Um, some, some groups work more discreetly and say, look, we've got our volunteers and we just want to manage them and we might send some out to corporates for them to volunteer with us or something like that. Um, so if we jump into an opportunity, um, it, it will tell us a little bit about it. I won't go too much into functionality, as I said, but um, the application forms are all built within the tool and so we're able to um, create specific specifically mapped opportunities that would allow the process, not just the, the, the cause promotion and the broadcasting of need, but all of the processes in between you need to ensure that, um, you know, things are managed effectively. And so when Lisa enters her information, including um, qualifications that she's able to upload, she sends that application and then that'll be pending. Now, uh, storytelling is another important aspect of what we do and we don't, um, we don't propose to replace lots of those, if you like, systems out there that provide storytelling opportunities like Facebook or LinkedIn. In fact, we integrate with those if people are interested. Um, but what is different and one of the problems we're trying to address is that concept of engaging different and wider audiences. So when you write an article, quite often there's a gap between when somebody reads about something, when they're most passionate about something, and when they decide to get busy and do something. And so instead of allowing them to just explore somebody's website to find where they might get involved, we can link our storytelling dynamically to calls to action. So I've read about this, this sounds like a great project to be involved in, but I press a button, I'm straight into that application process. So reducing that if you like dissonance between cause awareness and cause action is one of the, the, the important things that we do. So if we fast forward a little bit, one of the most powerful things that Bee Collective is able to offer is the concept of that social record. And so once again, this is a verified account of what Lisa has contributed to her in her community. So you can see her hours are validated. Um, she hasn't had to enter those hours. They've been prompted to the volunteer managers to certify uh, automatically upon completion of those. The skills have automatically mapped through. They've been prompted to write testimonials that they may deem as Lisa being a good person to write one for. Um, these are the sorts of things which are quite important in changing that value proposition for our volunteers. So, you know, Lisa was 
enthusiastic, turned up on time, worked well with others, those sorts of things. We start to reinforce those soft skills that start to provide that ancillary benefit to people like Lisa. And to take that a step further, she's able to take that information, she's able to pick and choose, once again, just emphasising it's her information and under her control. Um, she may like all of it, she may like some of it, maybe something's um, a bit sensitive that she doesn't want on a CV. But without any experience writing one, she can press a button and she's got a verified social record. Um, so this is um, a, a very important part of the work that we do in engaging our charity sector to find interesting ways of adding that value to their volunteering network, to give them something tangible to show. Um, in the mental health space, it's an important part of showing people uh, a way to connect outside of isolation and to um, you know, bolster the, the, the skills that they're able to accumulate that make them feel purposeful. Um, and I suppose um, even in um, you know, business, it's a way for organisations to use volunteering as a framework to improve skill and development as well. Um, so working with councils and other and universities um, we're finding there's a lot of interest in how to explore the concept of this verified social record as part of that, you know, increased value proposition to, to, their, to their volunteers. Um, maybe that's a healthy place to pause for a little. There might be some questions or comments that people might like to discuss or talk about. Yeah, by all means, uh, feed your questions through on the Q&A or in the chat function there. Um, um, Rob, the social record looks smashing, doesn't it? I mean, what a, what a great opportunity for people to, to, to have something easily polished that gives them credibility, gives them a, a legitimate uh, example of what they've done to, to, uh, to, to advance themselves and their community. Yeah, I think um, one of the interesting spaces where this has become, um, I, I won't say unexpected, but certainly really um, interesting, um, is a lot of charity organisations are usually the recipients of volunteers. Um, and so we've, we're working with quite a few organisations at the moment in terms of how they can flip that a little bit and say, well, actually, um, like if you take, you know, the Cancer Council, if you take, you know, organisations such as, say, Variety that um, have, um, you know, uh, children that are often the recipients of people's goodwill, organising packs and getting, you know, delivering people to, um, whether it's treatments and those sorts of things, to actually look at volunteering and the building of a social record as a restorative aspect of health is really quite paradigm changing in the sense mm -hmm. that, um, you know, um, we're doing so a lot of work at the moment with those um, with impairments and uh, differently abled people who are able to look at what they can do. And so whilst they might still need volunteers in order to organise events for them and, and those sorts of things, they can actually be a part of um, going out into the community themselves, building their social record, and that actually becoming part of that charity's offer in terms of their program. So mm. it's quite a versatile, versatile um, tool that can be used in quite innovative ways. Mm. Terrific. Um... No Q and A just yet. So uh, if you'd like to carry on, uh, yeah, wait for any of those brave souls out there uh, to to chip in with any questions. But uh, you mentioned in the meantime, uh, Rob, that you're in Wales. I believe you're also in Northern Ireland and uh, a few other places now. Yeah. So we've um, we're actually in a very um, uh, interesting position in um, the UK. We've got a, a a team over there and working throughout the UK on different initiatives, one of the largest of which is in Northern Ireland. So um, through there is a peak body there, um, Scott, which would be your complete envy because every charity actually filters through them. They've got three and a half thousand charities that all work through their portal. And so mm. we actually provide the um, volunteering infrastructure for Northern Ireland, essentially, by way mm. of this portal. Um, and so what's interesting um, is that in terms of information that they're able to, to gather, and I'll go into that in a little bit, um, they're actually able to determine 
holistically what is happening um, in terms of where people are spending their time in terms of causes, um, where the greatest need is, um, what people are most passionate about, the skills that are being more utilised um, and those sorts of metrics. So, yeah, and, and interestingly, we, we've, we've also onboarded or almost onboarded another organisation uh, called Business in the Community. So whilst Volunteer Now is the, if you like, charity interface to the sector, um, Business in the Community is the business face. So there's you know, hundreds of organisations now within the same infrastructure that the charities are in. So the understanding we're able to glean of the need in the community is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and the power of which the organisations have to direct change rather than, you know, research, evaluating focus groups, they're able to see in real time at one o'clock, at five o'clock, um, what's actually going on, which is, you know, pretty powerful. Mm. Incredibly um, powerful, isn't it? You know, that, that's kind of uh, the gold standard. Oh, gold standard. Mm. Very good. Yeah, that's right. And the mm. Wales project's really interesting. I know I mentioned it before, but um, that was a government tender in order to deliver a social prescribing um, project. And, and so for those who aren't familiar with the term social prescribing, um, the concept came out of a pilot in Scotland where um, instead of purely prescribing um, medications for those with um, dealing with quite you know depressive circumstances around isolation um, they started to prescribe community activity um, through GPS and, 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 and health professionals and you know surprise surprise um, who would have thought that people actually felt pretty good after doing it purposeful mm -hmm. uh, more connected um, we're actually getting outdoors more understanding other people's perspectives and maybe thinking their life wasn't as terrible as as others um, and we all understand the regener regenerative uh, properties of volunteering but to actually show it empirically was just so powerful and so um, our infrastructure mm. is now being implemented as part of a social um, prescribing project. And so we are able to have, if you like, a process for managing that social prescription so that we do end up with that social record. We do end up with tailored and curated mm. opportunities for specific individuals. So yeah, another you know, interesting project and the sort of stuff that we love getting involved in. Yeah. Um, okay, shall I? Oh, exciting my, stuff. Anyway, onwards. Okay. Um, so I won't go, to, once again, this is going a little bit into the, the functionality, but I I'll, I'll, I'll just wanted to show you in terms of the back end, how people manage these uh, charity groups. Um, once again, everything I'm showing you here is free and accessible, um, but, uh, and I'll clarify where it isn't for those who are probably thinking this doesn't make sense. Um, but uh, yeah, the idea is we didn't want any financial barrier to people managing volunteering and doing good. So um, this is what a manager sees of a particular group. They're able to see all the actions that they have to do, whether there's partnership requests, endorsement requests, timesheets or volunteer applications. Um, and essentially what we're showing here is an ability to not just manage an opportunity within your own group, of which some people might exclusively do. But for those who are interested in sending that out to councils or to businesses, the idea is you can take this computer tutor, um, you can socially share it, as I mentioned on Facebook and LinkedIn. And in this instance, we're gonna send an endorse request to Rotary because they've specifically asked for opportunities to help. You can even be so specific as to say, this isn't for anyone in the public and only for members of a specific group because perhaps you're in the, in the business of program design or you've got a particular corporate client that's asked you for specific bespoke programs. So that's one of the things you're able to manage. Um, what happens on the other end, if I'm now the Rotary person, once again, they've got a profile just like Lisa and everybody else. But when they're, when they're managing their page, you'll see that there's an endorse request here from uh, United. You could go into that, you could vet it, look at their application process, make sure it's, it's acceptable and appropriate for your members, and then you can endorse it. Um, one of the paid elements that we have, so just to make that distinction, is the concept of a social record, sorry, a social currency. And so what you're able to do is to provide a whole recognition framework within your group that might help you initiate and manage programs. Um, examples being, if a university wants to give first rights to internships for students that were more engaged than others, councils, 
um, you know, acknowledging citizens that are more active in community by giving assisted public transport access, or it might be a charity that has some business benefits from some of their partners that they want to actually add in, um, apply credits to a specific opportunity, which might be um, difficult to fill or specific to their mission, and then run a program that way. Um, it's a free CRM for those who uh, understand what that is. It's basically managing members and different types of members with lists and things like that. Um, and uh, you're able to um, look at a, a number of different things like uh, an advanced filter, which is able to look at different um, uh, criteria of your members. So who's got a first aid certificate and a working with children's check and speaks Spanish and leaves 10 kilometers and has done less than 50 hours. And then when I've created that list, I then know the members that qualify. But really importantly, because these people control their own data, if those qualifications are being added, if they're acquiring languages and skills and experience, if they're a part of your membership group, um, which you tightly control, um, they will update that information within your smart filters, which is kind of cool. Um, you can go in, create notes that are private to you, upload qualifications that are instantly shared with your members if that's something that you do through your program. Um, but what I'd like to show you is the reporting because that's one of the fundamental things that, that is, is um, being sorely missing in our sector and one of the things that we really want to provide. So this is a free accessible report for anyone, any size, um, where you can see uh, the nature of that engagement as soon as the timesheets are ticked off. So the information will go back to the volunteer. It'll go to the charity. And if there's been a conduit in between, like a volunteer resource centre, like a... Um, Council, um, if there's been somebody brokered in any way, or, or a business, for example, who's you know been the portal for their employees to get involved, all of those parties automatically receive the information that's relevant to them, and nobody outside of that exchange gets access. So it is very tightly controlled information, and it only goes to relevant people. Uh, but this report is going to tell. I mean, if you think of a small sporting club, for example, being having having access to this kind of information, you know, gone are the days of the, and, and this is what we're hearing from people, you know, they're not getting the $20,000 for a sign on the oval anymore. Um, but if we can give some added messaging to what we're achieving with those sponsorship or grants that we're applying for as charities and we're able to quantify what we've achieved because that's what government's asking for these days. They're not, they're not interested in funding the same old programs that they've been funding for 10 years. There's so much noise in that space, they want to cut through. They want to be able to say loud and proud, what was achieved? What have we done? And so this will, um, in, a, in a verified way, account for what was achieved by the organisation. Um, this is a free report, but once again, for those wondering how we actually uh, make any money, um, we do have uh, another layer of reporting, which is part of what we call B Collective Plus. And so you are able to go through into much more granular detail, understand um, engagement in your organisation by gender, by age, um, being able to split down through there, having a look at what causes we're most passionate about. And this is not just true for charities, but true for businesses, for universities, for councils. Um, the idea is that this information is available in real time um, and mapped at the time we create the opportunity. So there's no effort in its creation. Um, even pushing down to actually look into where are our volunteering, where's our volunteering happening most? Why is this um, branch or why is this location more engaged than the other? And that allows us to have much more powerful insights into um, how we can affect that change. That might be another good pause point. That's so Scott. powerful. Yeah, let, let, let's um, invite any questions uh, through the Q&A function down the bottom. Rob, your product has obviously matured a lot in the last couple of years. I mean, you know, from what you, what, you know, I saw five years ago to how it looks now, it, it looks like a beast in respect to the, um, the, the intelligence of uh, the report building, the, the intelligence of how you can uh, carve out different parts of your data relevant to the opportunity or to the, to the request of the, the stakeholder, the funder, et cetera. It's, uh, it's bloody amazing, isn't it, really? Yeah, it's a big task. I mean, the, 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 big, the big challenge for us is how do you grow an ecosystem like this? 
Um, yeah. You know, the, the reality is it's not the sort of thing where you can go out broadcast and then, you know, the whole population is going to sign up to it. And so what we end up doing is building little ecosystems. So if you take Rotary, for example, when we onboard Rotary, we look at what does Rotary currently do? What does their ecosystem look like? Well, let's replicate that within the framework, get that working. But very quickly, the conversation changes because, as you know, and Rotary is a great example, um, everybody in Rotary runs a business uh, or is involved in business. And so you can see how quickly their ecosystem works. But for it to work traditionally, it's all manual. It's all offline. It's all, oh, John, do you think your business could get involved in doing some planning around the trip to East Timor for water generation? Yeah, sure. If we're a bee collective, you can actually manage the entire process. And so it's about making our world smaller, more connected, but with the rigour you'd expect so that you can do it with integrity. Um, that's really what, what we're doing and why we're building these, if you like, little ecosystems around the world. Excellent. So Emma's given us a couple of questions here, so we'll work through them. So the first one is, does the success of this program depend on volume? That is, do you need a certain number of people in a certain area for this to be successful? It's a great question. And I think perhaps the tail end of that last, last comment was really uh, where I was going with that. Um, the idea is you can use this in a standalone way. So there's no difference to any other solution you can see out there, although I think it looks nicer and it works better. But that's, that's, that's probably quite a biased view. Um, but the difference is that not only can you do the things you'd naturally expect by just using in a standalone function, but we can quite quickly just build your ecosystem. Uh, and so what I mean by that is if you are working with some key business clients, if you are working with um, a local council or uh, some, some a, a group within education, um, it, it's actually quite um, low barriers to entry to create um, that little working model. And so, you know, you can, you can create an interface to accept volunteering opportunities, you know, in, it takes less than five minutes. So um, the idea is that it's not about conquering all at once. It's about um, trying to uh, strategically work with each particular group to make sure that they're, they're, they're working as well as they can within their ecosystem. But of course, the benefit is that, uh, you know, months, years down the track, as different nodes start to connect, the, the opportunities to expand, to scale, to uh, get involved in, in different programs, you know, become exponential because mm. the idea is that you will find groups that you're able to partner with that you hadn't even considered before. Um, mm. There will be councils that all of a sudden introduce you if you're just say so you're concentrating on new migrants and refugees um, and all of a sudden through um, connecting through infrastructure, then th there's a group there that actually is a wonderful source of, you know, mentoring and advocacy uh, people. Well, if they weren't available to you before, all of a sudden new worlds sort of open up and that's really some part of that philosophy. Mm, great. Uh, Emma also asks, uh, have you had experience in regional areas? Um, regional areas are probably the most wonderful example of what we do because they're already so malleable. I mean, the idea is, you know, what Bee Collective is, is founded on is the idea of um, interconnection, um, you know, that smaller community feel around how people actually work collaboratively or, if you like, collectively together. And so regional areas are actually um, one, of the er one of the ways in which we can actually think more holistically about an ecosystem. So Mildura is a very good example. Um, you know, we've got you know, large not-for-profits, the council using it. Um, we've got, um, you know, education, educators or educational institutions, and then a number of small little groups, big and small, all interfacing through common infrastructure. Some of them not working together all of the time. Some of them having, like, the council would have a bit more of a sort of a, a hub feel to how they interface with it and happy to promote anyone. But they're wonderful examples. In New Zealand, the Wairapa, which... Um, Scott, hopefully you still remember your, your heritage um, of, of um, what New Zealand's like, but, you know, not necessarily large populations of people, but very tightly knitted groups of people who are very passionate about what they're able to achieve collectively. Uh, and so when we've gone down there, I think we're up to 10 different organisations now, even within that that, that, that area that are all starting to look at, hang on, there's a wider opportunity here. How do we actually get our community humming? And to be able to look at aggregated uh, information on what we've been able to achieve collectively. So regional areas are gold. They're just really waiting for something like this. Terrific. And we just had a, a reminder about um, 
Tell us more about Play for Lives, which I know you'll get onto shortly. Yep, that's a it's a really good example. Um, I don't think I've. I'm just going to go through this. Just make sure I won't go through social currency. Okay. Um, so um, for those, the other way that we're we're sustainable is a lot of people think, well, Be Collective's great and it's free, and I love that, and that's and it's um, you know better than what we're using, uh, but. The reality is we already have a website or we have systems that, that need interfacing with. Um, and so um, a lot of the time we get asked if we can, people sometimes use the word white label, but how do you bring, if you like, our engine into the, their, their, their website or intranet and things like that. And so that's one of the things that we build um, and that we charge for so that if, you know, KPMG or... Um, you know, the Cancer Council or whoever they are would like to um, have a bit more of a seamless experience where they can completely tr control the narrative, then we build our engine into their, into their website. Um, the Play for Lives campaign was really interesting. Really, it doesn't exist in the sense that it's just a movement of change. Craig Foster, um, for those who are familiar with him, he's a bit of a social crusader. He's, um, he's got a never-ending tank of petrol and he gets out there and um, he just makes good things happen. And so he started a movement called Play for Lives. Um, which was all around how do we leverage our idle sporting communities in Australia to fill the gap that has been left by our ageing volunteers during COVID-19. And so the idea is that there are essential services that are not being uh, delivered, like uh, food packages. We know that, um, you know, in New South Wales, they use volunteers to deliver um, help transport people to medical treatments. Um, you know, there's a whole range of stuff that still needs to happen. People aren't getting medicine prescriptions, blah, blah, blah. And so the idea is how do we get this sporting community mobilised to get out there as a team and play for lives, if you like, not points, given that there's no, there's no um, sporting happening. Although I, our recent announcements, announcements suggest that we'll be watching it all again very soon. Um, in any case, there was no framework to run it. So Facebook groups are great if you just want to tell people, hey, this is what's going on, get on board, or tell us what you think, or this is the lovely croissant that I had at the cafe this morning. But if you want to manage something, if you want to do something with all the rigour that um, anyone who's here from the charity sector knows that you can't just slap together an opportunity. It needs to be considered. You need to have vetting processes. You need to be able to communicate um, the requirements. You need to be able to brief effectively. Um, the idea is that we needed a framework to deliver that. And so what we've helped do, and this was, if you like, a pro bono initiative for, from our point of view, is we delivered a whole campaign around it. And it was called Play for Lives. Um, and so everything you see here, we've got a big creative team, a big marketing team, we've got lots of developers. So um, building this is something that we're very familiar with doing for charities and for councils and unis and things like that. But the idea is that effectively what you're looking at is B Collective's engine within the look and feel of another identity. In this instance, we've made it up because it doesn't exist. Uh, but um, the idea is that uh, people can go through, you know, watch watch movies about what the campaign's all about. Um, we're called, there's basically three calls to action. I'm a community organisation in need. I'm a sporting organisational club that we want to get involved and get our team mobilised. Or I'm a player and I just want to get out there and do something. And so lots of different, you know, opportunities to actually get people engaged. And so when you go to be collective and you just want to get involved, the opportunities will basically be sucked from the B Collective engine and they'll be presented within the look and feel of whatever website you'd like it integrated with. So you'll see, start seeing all these opportunities here um, that are listing within the campaign. Um, you know, videos for kids um, for variety, ranging from food deliveries, um, you know, his bad hair may or something like that. I can click on that. I can find out more information about how I can get involved and I can apply. And everything gets presented within, you know, the look and feel of the particular uh, web, uh, website. So that campaign also allows community organisations to um, get involved. So it may well be that councils, for example, might have a way in which they could use a portal where community organisations can post their opportunities. Um, but I'm able to go through 
um, there's my volleyball team, for example, and load um, a particular um, volunteer opportunity uh, within the Play for Lives framework. And just on that, which um, people might find interesting, um, you know, this is what our wizard looks like. It's comprehensive. It maps everything. Um, it allows you to do um, not just the broadcast, but, you know, adding shifts, assigning the number of shifts. Um, it's a, you're able to create customised application processes. Um, this is all free, um, you know, being able to go through and go, in our form for this opportunity, you know, these are the sorts of fields that we needed. This one is mandatory, you know. So there's a lot of great systems in here which help any sized organisation, not just the small ones. The big ones don't do this well either. Um, and so, and when I say they don't do it well, the, it's cost prohibitive to invest in systems that allow people to do it well. Um, and that's sort of part of our, our mission, if you like, is to bring this accessibility to any sized organisation. You know, volunteer briefing processes that add documents that send them out. And then you're able to share those um, beyond your ecosystem, if you like, to others, through your partners, through other groups that you're able to identify on the system that, you know, you might be uh, interested in. So does that make oh, sense? That's excellent, yeah. And that's across all of Australia, by all accounts. Yeah, so it's an interesting campaign because it's one of those things that does transcend, you know, the, the beyond borders. Uh, but the reality is this campaign is a little bit unique because it's got a front person. It's got somebody out there every day of me, of a media background who's able to really get gather some momentum around it. Um, you know, Craig is tireless in his pursuit of this sort of stuff. And, we're, you know, it's even hard to keep up with him. <laughs> so, um, you know, it kind of needs, uh, and you've got to remember, this is not an entity in itself. So it's not like there's four or five people sitting in, um, you know, the office who are just thinking about Play for Lives. In fact, our team has largely been driving the, the volunteer management for this as part of our, our giving as an, as an organisation. Uh, but um, the reality is if you're a charity organisation and you'd like the same engine, if you like the Bee Collective engine so that you can do things more professionally, potentially, uh, and provide the social record um, to your members and a range of other storytelling and um, other benefits, that's the sort of thing that we do every day. What a, what a comprehensive integrated response, isn't it? You know, it's pivoting to the, to the need of communities uh, and, and, you know, showing what a, what a way of mobilising, uh, you know, as you say, sports clubs and, uh, and sports administrators to, to, you know, helping out where, uh, where they can, as they can, which is, which is just brilliant. So really, really great stuff um, going on there. Um, so again, we'll pause here and take any Q and A. I know that there was, um, you know, two people that said, "Tell us more about Play for Live." So hopefully, that's um, satiated your your interest at this minute on regards to that exciting platform uh, that's that's making a contribution to uh, to, to the COVID response. Um, we're almost uh, got another five minutes here, if 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 you like, Rob. So if you want to kind of um, if you have any more, or we can uh, kind of talk more generally for the next five minutes in case we get any Q and A. Uh, through the through the next couple of minutes, or uh, over to you, really. What would you prefer? Um, look, the only uh, the only other thing I'd say is, given our sort of social agenda around the community change, uh, one of the things that uh, we tend to do is to um, segment a lot of the societal challenges that we have in our world. So, and try and apply infrastructural solutions to those. So, yes, there are individual engagements with specific charities and as I say, unis and councils and businesses. But um, part of our philosophy is how do we create wider systemic change? So some of the other key areas that we've been doing some work in uh, are around things like restorative justice. So how do we change, um, yeah, once again, uh, change that paradigm of how we look at, you know, um, uh, changing behaviours over, over it's not a short period of time, but how do we have a framework, framework by which that could and, should and, and could change? And so instead of um, looking at quite traditional methods of, of volunteering or, if you like, community, community work, um, able to look at more curation and control around opportunities that give 
um, offenders or people caught up in that system an, an opportunity to, you know, self empower their journey, albeit through some some rigor that you'd expect with that with with those sorts of participants, mm -hmm. but um, creating very different outcomes at the end with the production of that social record. Um, the other thing that we're doing a lot of work in is around emergency response. So being able, we are building uh, what we believe will be the biggest, the largest um, emergency um, group of volunteers uh, in the world uh, by country so that uh, people are actually able to uh, not just tag opportunities as being um, appropriate, for those for, for, for volunteers, but volunteers themselves can opt in identifying the skills, location, and their um, area of interest of getting involved when things go wrong. So earthquakes, fires, COVID nineteen, whatever whatever it may be, the way in which the system works means that organisations can sort of jump in and out whenever they feel that that might be useful. Um, we don't we don't suggest that everybody will end up using Be Collective, but it's pretty um, low effort and low barriers to jump to jump in and out of it. Yeah. Um, so, and without cost, it's certainly something which we feel creates, um, you know, a large incentive for people to just, you know, get involved as opposed to, for example, if you're not, if you're a business that isn't that socially active, as soon as the opportunity or interest does come about, you can act on it, get involved, do something. Uh, and that's really part of our Great. message. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so last last grasp for a Q and A. Yeah, please feed in any questions uh, if you have any. Uh, look, it's been a really great uh, session with Rob here this afternoon, hearing about both the, the developments of Be Collective and uh, and also Play for Lives. Um, while we're inviting any Q and A, Rob, what what would you say is? Um, I, I mean, you know, this is a question people don't really like to answer, but what what part of the uh, platform Be Collective are you most proud of, really? Uh, look, for me, the, the, I, I would probably pick, and uh, the first thing I'd pick would be social infrastructure only because, um, for me, that's what resonates the most as the point of difference. Um, but that's probably quite a technical thing um, and a philosophical thing more than anything. I think from uh, a public a publicly available benefit, that so, the social record is probably the thing that I'm most proud of because... Um, every time we show it to people, you can see, you know, the whispers turn into conversation, the light bulbs go off. Oh, actually, this would really help. Oh, wow, what a great thing for our students. What a great thing for our employees. What a great thing for our residents. Um, people understand that there's a value in doing good, but we, we really don't have much to show for it. And so for me, that's probably the thing I'm most proud of. Proud of yeah. and, and as far as I'm aware, it's the only platform that does a social record. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, it is that, again that gold standard that you know uh, to be able to showcase uh, that sort of so effortlessly as well as uh, integrate it in amongst every all of the rest of the volunteer management system uh, process in here is just such a, a, a combination. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, there, obviously there are hundreds of systems that can record information. So, and you could you could query that system as a volunteer in many cases and work mm -hmm. out what you've done. Uh, but to do that to every single one that you're involved in, um, you know, that that's a task not many volunteers are up for. And certainly we do understand that each of those organisations records that information with various degrees of integrity, some on paper, some on spreadsheets, some on databases, some on programs. Um, but as you can imagine, um, to produce something as we have that's freely accessible, there's not much of a financial incentive for other organisations to do what we're doing. And so we know that this doesn't exist for some good reason. I mean, this is a social investment for us in, in community benefit. Yes, we want to do it sustainably and we, we believe that our model supports that, but we're not sidetracked by opportunities to, you know, leverage commercial gain within the, within the platform at critical points that you would normally see when you sign up for a platform and go, oh, God, they got me in. Oh, I've got to press the button. Okay, there we are. There's the catch. I couldn't quite see it. Uh, quite, quite, quite genuinely, um, this is going to help you if you need help in, with, with technology. Terrific. Look, Rob, this has been fascinating. Thanks so much for being a part of our Tech for Good series. It's been an absolute delight to, to, take, uh, to take listeners on this, uh, on this journey today. So uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up there. So uh, thanks to those that uh, have attended and for those that will tune in after the fact. Um, 
Yep, and uh, Emma's passing on her thanks as well, Rob. So, uh, look, uh, this will be on, on our website shortly. Uh, in two weeks' time, we have um, have Good Company uh, presenting their, their platform. And uh, in the meantime, we uh, look forward to hosting um, Craig, you know, from Playful Lives as part of our uh, our broadcast next Monday. Oh, and awesome. Hearing Victoria broadcast. Yep, it's four hours of interviews, engagement. Uh, Josephine Kafagna has interviewed him, so... We'll be we'll be playing that interview uh, next next Monday between one and five pm as part of uh, National Volunteer Week. So, uh, look, thanks again, Rob, for your time this afternoon, and, and uh, hopefully uh, you and family all stay well. And uh, look forward to seeing you around the around the traps in the near future. Oh, thank you for having me, everyone. Have a lovely day. Cheers. Bye for now, everyone. See you.